Well, good afternoon. Thank you all very much for showing up and thank you to Professor Hoop for or inviting me and going to a lot of trouble organizing this and making sure I got here. And when I got here, I went over first to the Alphonse Center and I thought the swimming pool looked quite inviting today. I didn't realize that, of course, I should be here, even though Professor Hooper told me it should be Alphonse Hall. So thank you all for showing up. Uh, I'm going to talk, uh, as the title, Using Catholicism to Build an Inclusive Church. Uh, and so I'm coming at this from a sociological perspective. And so I know not all of you may necessarily be sociologists, but from a variety of disciplines and experiences and backgrounds. So I welcome uh, in your questions, and if you want to interrupt me as I go along to clarify anything, uh, please feel free to do so. But I hope we'll have 20 minutes or so towards the end of the talk for questions and answers and for discussion. Uh, so, of course, when we talk about Catholicism, we don't have to, but we tend to always think of in terms of the papacy, and certainly in the current moment, Pope Francis is a celebrity pope, really, from the moment he was uh, elected. Uh, so a lot of my talk today is really looking at the contemporary church, and that, of course, coincides uh, with Francis's papacy. And I would argue that his papacy coincides with what I call a contrite church. Uh, what I mean by that is that uh, in the wake of the sex abuse scandals, and I know these are ongoing issues still within the church, but back in 2010, Pope Benedict made a very formal and sincere apology. It was actually in the context of a letter uh, to the Catholics of Ireland, apologizing not just to the harm caused to young children and their families, but also apologizing for what he called the failures of leadership on the part of the church itself, and specifically on the part of bishops. And then he also noted that the church needs to engage in a program of institutional renewal, uh, which to me was a very important uh, turn because it really wanted to see what can we do to get Catholicism back on track to be the vibrant public religious tradition that it has been for so many, uh, obviously, centuries and that hopefully moving into the future. Of course, Francis, uh, of course, Pope Benedict breaking with history made an unprecedented announcement back in February 2013 where he announced his intended resignation and within a month we had a new pope and that was Pope Francis. So this is sort of the, the jumping off point for my talk. As well as a contrite church, Francis' papacy and Benedict's too indeed coincides with increased secularism. And this is particularly noteworthy in the context of American society. It's certainly been a long-term trend in Western Europe and in the West more generally. But America is quite distinctive in that even though it's a highly secular society, religion is extremely important. Uh, and in fact, more people identify with a religious tradition here than basically any other Western society other than Ireland, which in fact now is itself losing a lot of its Catholicism. So if you look at this graph here, what's significant is the quite stunning increase uh, from about 7%, which was quite a stable percentage for really the first half of the 20th century, to in the last 30 years or so, an accelerated increase in the number of Americans who identify with no religious tradition. Uh, so this jump, and it's, uh, it's fairly steady and momentous and is continuing, is one at least indicator of increased secularism in American society. And as some of you may well be aware, the younger generation, your generation, the millennials as we tend to call them, those in their 18 to 25 in, up into their early 30s, are more likely than any other generation to identify with no religious tradition. So this is a, this is a big deal sociologically. It also raises obviously lots of questions for the church. But from a sociological perspective, this really is quite a stunning turn of events in American culture and has a lot of implications. Uh, but Francis, as Pope, has been trying to amplify, as I say, the path of renewal identified by Benedict. Uh, and he does that in various ways. As you may well know, he has issued very important exhortations, statements, and papal encyclicals, even in the last five years, the, the five years in which he has been Pope. And he really emphasizes his intentionality in setting the church on new paths and in writing new chapters so that the church can regain its relevance and adapt to the current realities. Uh, he frequently says that realities are more important than ideas. Now, we don't want to take that out of context, but it's basically to argue that the realities, empirical secular realities, need to be, as he says, in ongoing conversation with doctrinal ideas. Uh, and that this is an ongoing conversation, and we see plenty of evidence of this in the church today. 
Uh, this, of course, is a thoroughly Catholic position. Principles of uh, incarnation and immanence theologically are core to Catholicism. And Catholic social teaching has long engaged with issues of social justice, for example. And Andrew Greeley, a well-known sociologist, had long argued, he talks about the Catholic imagination. Uh, and what he means by this is that is in the everyday realities. Uh, despite this emphasis on incarnation and imminence, there has also, of course, been a lot of anxiety about the threats, if you will, that secularism, because secularism by definition means that religion is losing its authority. And so there has been concerns, certainly among church leaders, about the anxiety that it provokes that secularism will undermine the authority of the church. And this secularism, or this anxiety was particularly prevalent with John Paul's lengthy papacy, where he tended to, to talk about secular society as being very distinct from what he would call the, the gospel of life, which uh, emphasized the moral, the fundamental and eternal moral truths of Catholic teaching. And he felt that there was a strong conflict uh, between secular culture and Catholic teaching. And similarly, to some extent also, Benedict has often emphasized what he calls the dictatorship of relativism, that amid uh, the, the sort of the multiculturalism and the multiple ideologies of contemporary society, that is very hard for people to stand up and say, this is a truth, and there's only one truth, and it cannot be contested by other people's lived realities or experiences. But Francis's appreciation for the secular, his emphasis that ideas and realities need to be an ongoing conversation, uh, this fits with what increasingly we talk about today in terms of sociology and what is often referred to as a post-secular. All that the post-secular means is that secularism, yes, we live in a secular Western society, but secularism has not eliminated religion. That's sort of the thesis initially was that with enlightenment thinking, with science, with modernization, religion would lose its authority. Certainly religion has lost a lot of its authority, but even still, certainly in American and other Western societies, which are highly economically modernized, highly developed, religion still matters. We still have Catholic colleges. We still have Catholic hospitals. We still have you know, a lot of people still identifying as Catholic or as some other religion. And so this post-secular is the term used as a way to try to make sense of, on the one hand, we have a secular reality, but we also have continuing attachments to religious identity. And so that the post-secular has to somehow negotiate these two, two different draws, if you will, uh, that the, the religious and the secular are co-mingling rather than uh, dichotomously opposed to one another. Uh, and so I, you know, Professor Hoop referenced my latest book, I call it post-secular Catholicism, but largely it's to try to get at this, what I might call a new reality. How is it that a religion, such a, a moderate public religion such as Catholicism, can try to reclaim increased relevance, not only in the public sphere, in terms of political debates and economic debates and social justice issues, but also in the lives of Catholics themselves, who for the most part embody highly secular experiences and expectations. Uh, and one of the principles of the post-secular is that religious and secular actors or citizens have to recognize each other as co-equals, that each is equal, but that we live in a secular society and if religious actors want to engage with uh, secular actors, that they have to actually draw on the language that is more culturally accessible and ordinary everyday language and therefore translate religious beliefs and specific Catholic principles into a language that will make sense to people regardless of their in religious or any other aspect of their background. Um, I argue that Pope Francis in particular shows a strong post-secular sensibility and this is largely evident in his, what might be called his communicative openness. Uh, most people have seen him on television. Some of you may have seen him when he came to the US and New York and Philadelphia. Uh, or you might have gone to the world youth meetings of families in Rio, some of the students before you, uh, when you were still 18 or 19. Uh, but he's a very open personality, but this also translates into a lot of his formal, not just his informal ways of being. Uh, 
uh, several instances he emphasizes that magisterial authority, what I mean by that is the authority of the office of the Pope, uh, sort of uh, given that we are a higher, the Catholic Church is a hierarchical church, the Pope is at the apex, at the top of that hierarchy, and that is the final source, many would argue, of interpretive authority. And while Francis is he tends to downplay that, to, to say that there are many sources of authority. There's scientific sources, there's local Catholic sources, there's local bishops across the world who have certain insights, there are ordinary people's insights, and that we have to be sensitive to those local knowledges, local realities. And he also, of course, uses a very plain spoken language when he speaks, and that adds to this what I call the post-secular sensibility, being able to engage with others who may not be religious at all, who may not be Catholic at all, and still make moral arguments that many at least, or some, find persuasive. Uh, and this openness and communicative openness resonates very much with Catholics' authority. What I mean by interpretive authority here, and this is something that uh, Professor Hoop mentioned at the beginning, is that Catholics have long taken as their birthright almost, but certainly conferred on them by Vatican II, that they have the freedom to speak their mind freely on issues of concern in society, but also on issues of concern in the church. Uh, so this is not, it's also about personal conscience and religious freedom, but it's more broadly that they have to take on the obligations of active citizenship within the church and seek to find ways to remedy any occasions of sin, of institutional sin or social relationship sin, and that they have this freedom, it's not just a freedom, but actually an obligation to make up their mind about what is the Catholic way to deal with certain realities. Uh, but of course, this is full of tension because when you have individual Catholics making up their own mind about things, that is in direct tension and conflict to some extent with the understanding also that the popes and the bishops have their own authority to tell Catholics what to do. And certainly historically, this has been a strong bone of contention in American, Catholic, in American Catholicism in particular. Um, this is a very full slide, you don't need to get all of it, but one way in which we see Catholics exercising their interpretive authority is again the number of Catholics, what the church often refers to as irregular Catholics, irregular in, in, in quotation marks, to mean Catholics who are not living in accordance with the objective teachings of the church. So for example, gay and lesbian Catholics, Catholics who are divorced and remarried without an annulment, Catholics who are in any cohabiting situation, many of these would be considered as irregular Catholics and they, they certainly are an important part of the Catholic church. But many of them, and here I just give some quotes, these are from uh, gay and lesbian Catholics who are members some years ago, uh, I did some study in Dignity Boston, but also did a survey follow-up with uh, national members there a few years ago. And typical of the kinds of things that gay and lesbian Catholics say is how can you be both? How can you be Catholic and be LGBT? And typical, I just read the, the first one here, both are core aspects of who I am. I grew up intensely engrossed in church and in the liturgy. My LGBT self is how God made me, but both I take on the journey equally. Uh, and the other quotes are similar. They talk about the integrity, the integral part of both the religious, their Catholic identity, and their sexual identity. And this is a typical sort of reasoning that if you were to talk to some Catholics, whoever they are, whether they're LGBT, whether they're divorced, no matter who they are, they make up their own minds about lots of different issues. Uh, one of the, what's captured here are, you know, asking Catholics, these are in national studies of self-identified Catholics, and I've been engaged in some of these studies over the last few years, but one of the questions that asks is who should have the final authority in coming to moral decisions on these complex issues, uh, such as divorce and remarriage, about abortion decisions, non-marital sex, same-sex relations, or using contraception. Uh, and as you see, the yellow here are individuals themselves. So the options are church leaders, individuals, or both in conversation. Uh, now, Catholic official teaching would say that there really should be both in conversation because if you emphasize personal conscience, you need to have an informed conscience. You can't just do whatever you please. And in order to have an informed conscience, you should be in conversation with your local priest. You should be reading encyclicals. You should be familiar with the catechism. So it really is a dialogue of the individual with official sources of church teaching. But Americans, going back uh, really to the post-Humane you know, Vitae, some of you may not be as familiar with as others, given the generational issues in the room here, 
uh, Humanae Vitae was an encyclical by Paul VI issued in, Pope Paul VI issued in 1968, which reaffirmed the church's ban and opposition to contraception. And that's a hugely, this, we're actually celebrating, I guess it's 50 years, this is 2018, so that was 1968. Um, that was hugely significant, both theologically, but also sociologically, because after this encyclical was issued, many American Catholics stopped going to church because they felt they couldn't go to mass and go to communion and use contraception. But after a few years, many started dwindling back and really set in motion this understanding of Catholicism that one can be a good Catholic and use contraception. Uh, and that really was this owning of Catholicism on their own terms, that the individual would make up their mind. And, and subsequently, we've seen them apply that same logic to all these other con you know, controversial moral issues, uh, most recently, of course, same-sex marriage. But it really dates back, uh, certainly one can see, the rupture in terms of church authority that Humanae Vitae uh, gave rise to. So that's just a, a little historical aside. But you see here that the individuals themselves say that it's their authority, it's up to them to make up their own mind. And so that's a very important part of American Catholicism. But one of the things that I, I'm not going to into this today, but it allows American Catholics actually to retain ownership of their religion. And this is partly, I would argue, why Catholicism is much more vibrant, one could argue, in American society than it is in any other Western society, so relative to Western Europe, for example, because American Catholics go to church, they're highly committed to Catholicism, but they also more or less decide their own moral behavior. Whereas, for example, right now in Ireland, for example, we don't have that same tradition of ownership of Catholicism, but of deference to the church authorities. Now that the church officials have lost some of the credibility with regard to sex abuse scandals and all of that, Irish Catholics are just walking away from the church. They're not saying, oh, it's my church and I'm not going to go. Whereas American Catholics really have this very strong, deep sense of commitment to the tradition and of ownership of Catholicism, even as they make up their own minds, use their own individual authority uh, about these issues. And so if you were to talk to your parents, your grandparents, certainly about the contraception issue, uh, if they're Catholic, I think they would echo a lot of things that you hear in national surveys or in qualitative studies uh, about people you know, struggling with some of these decisions but ultimately deciding to stay Catholic even as they disobey what might be seen as official church teaching. Uh, and just, you see it further in, in aggregate data, you know, today about 9% of Catholics are currently divorced, uh, and about a quarter of them have been divorced at some point in their life. 10% uh, are currently living, report living in a, with a partner in a cohabiting situation, and 40% have at some point done that. And approximately, tw in a major survey by Pew back a few years ago, <coughs> excuse me, approximately 20% of adults who identify as LGBT also identify as Catholic. So obviously this sort of, what I call the mosaic of blending of a mix of ideas, of secular experiences, secular expectations about uh, uh, conscience and about uh, equality mix in with still a commitment to the tradition even as people do their own thing in many of these situations. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so back to Francis. So Fra these are the some slice of some of the secular and Catholic realities that Francis's papacy is engaging with. And in doing so, there's a lot of evidence that he is intentionally interested in building what might be seen as a more inclusive society and also a more inclusive church. Uh, today, I want to just say a few words about both of those without going into too much detail, but I'm happy to say more if people have questions. Uh, if you look at this interview he gave back in September 2013, it was a very lengthy interview that he gave. It was published in America, the Jesuit magazine. Uh, and among the many things he said, he said, we cannot insist only on issues related to abortion, gay marriage, and the use of contraception. When we speak about these, we have to talk about them in a context. The teaching of the church is clear, but it's not necessary to talk about these things all the time. We have to find a new balance. And so one could argue that the last five years provides some evidence of how might a new balance be nudged or achieved, and what are some of the tensions and issues with that. Uh, certainly, Francis has given a huge amount of uh, focus to economic inequality. His exhortation in November 2013, Joy of the Gospel, used very strong, clear, accessible language to really provide a very damning uh, critique of capitalism and of economic inequality and of 
all the aspects of that. Uh, and as he says in that, that the inclusion of the poor in society is fundamental, right? It's not just some social issue, but it's fundamental at this time in history and to shaping the future of humanity. So I think we can see that as he's saying that social exclusion, economic inequality is really the moral task that we in society, regardless of religion, regardless of politics, have to confront. Uh, and he was highly critical of all the evidence of inequality. He talks about an economy of exclusion, a throwaway culture. Uh, and he's, he instead, in fully in line with Catholic social teaching, emphasizes solidarity, the solidarity of the common good, that we are all responsible for the well-being of our fellow human beings. Uh, and that solidarity, it's, a, it's an expansive understanding of social inclusion, that it's not just in terms of redistribution, for example, of welfare, benefits, but it really is that everyone has to feel that they can fully participate in society. So the notion in Catholic social teaching of just wages, for example, it's not simply a living wage, it's really, it's beyond that, it's more than that, it's so that you can live a life where you can fully participate in all the institutions and in society and fully realize your humanity. Uh, so as he says in that, financial markets are supposed to serve people, not the other way around. This was a a message, an exhortation that got a lot of publicity. There was a lot of pushback against it. I'm happy to talk about some of that. But it really was a very clear articulation of long-standing Catholic social teaching. But in Francis's voice, he really amp amplified it in a way that's made sort of populist sense, that people really could connect to what he was saying, especially, of course, in the wake of the Great Recession and the financial crisis and the ongoing uh, issues around trying to enhance uh, or trying to sort of have less inequality, at the, have so many people at the top and so many people at the bottom. So trying to, to make it more balanced. He also has written, again, this was historically distinctive. He dedicated a whole encyclical, uh, Laudato Si, to the issue of climate change. Other popes going back to Paul VI have talked on and off about environmental degradation, the ecological crisis. Pope Benedict has uh, done a lot of initiatives. He was known as the Green Pope because he was so good at drawing attention to environmental issues. But Francis gave a whole encyclical to this. And again, here he intentionally, he makes an appeal. He says, I want an appeal for a new dialogue about how we are shaping the future of our planet. And just as he talks about the inclusion of the poor as being fundamental to society, he also talks here about climate change and how humanity needs to recognize that our current lifestyle is not going to sustain our values as such. And as he says, linking economic inequality with climate change, he says we are faced not with two separate crises, one environmental and the other social, but rather with one complex crisis that is both social and environmental. Strategies for a solution demand an integrated approach to combating poverty restoring dignity to the excluded, and at the same time, protecting nature. So these are two issues that, for him, uh, are totally intertwined. Sometimes people who are activists, political activists, think of climate change as one issue, and economic equality is another issue. But for Francis, these are intertwined. They are totally commingled because they're interrelated. He's also shifting away then from so-called societal problems to the realities of sort of not just society, but also in, within the Catholic Church. Uh, Francis famously in a press conference on an airplane coming back from Rio from World Youth Day, somebody asked him, a journalist asked him a question about gays and the light, or not about homosexuals in the church, and he said, if someone is gay and searches for the Lord, who am I to judge? This probably is one of the most quoted, at least the second half of this, who am I to judge? Uh, this line of his is probably the most quoted line of all his lines, and people who know nothing about the Catholic Church know this line, who am I to judge? Uh, so, but what was fascinating about that statement and the larger context, first of all, was his use of the language, if someone is gay, because up until that point, and still the official documents of the church don't use the word gay, they use the word homosexual, uh, but also this who am I to judge, the non-judgmental attitude, uh, which in a sense he has become known for, uh, so that really sent a very strong message to a lot of people, not just to gays and not just to gay Catholics, but to an awful lot of people, Catholic and non-Catholic, that perhaps the Catholic Church can be a bigger tent, which it sort of promises to be with the very word Catholic. It's supposed to be all-inclusive. It's a universal church. Uh, further evidence of his sort of attunement to gay realities and to their sort of marginal experience historically within the church are what I call his symbolically significant silences – 
when he visited back in September 2015 and made a, an address to the US Congress, he was talking about the various challenges uh, that face families today. Uh, but he actually didn't mention anything about the increased legal or cultural acceptance of same-sex marriage, for example, even though one might have thought that he would have. Uh, and in Joy of the Gospel, the same exhortation in which he talks about economic inequality, he didn't in identify a cultural acceptance of same-sex relationships as a negative cultural force. So in the context of his statements, even when he has opportunities to maybe make negative comments about certain groups in the church, gays or others, he tends not to do that. This is part of his non-judgmental. He focuses on larger structural issues, such as economic inequality, such as the challenges in you know, families setting up a household when it's hard for them to get good employment, uh, that they have to work more than one job, etc. Um, and then in his uh, exhortation, Amoris Laetitia, this was issued in a, about a, two years ago in April 2016, he actually noted that same-sex unions can provide stability, right? So Catholic teaching is opposed to, obviously, is opposed to gay marriages, same-sex marriages, but at the same time, it also highly values the stability of marriage and the stability of that as a union, which is in the church's teaching, sort of the core social unit of society, so to speak. Uh, so it's interesting there that he affirmed the stability that same-sex unions can offer. Uh, and he didn't contradict the influential uh, German Cardinal uh, Reinhard Marx, who has said that the church should apologize to gays or that we should also look at structures and how civil society uh, operates so that they, we can enhance some of the life experiences and stability of gay relationships. So all the so church teaching on gays has not changed. The official church teaching is, has been the same going back to the 1970s and the 1980s when there were some formal statements on that topic. Uh, but with this pope in particular, there's definitely a shifting away, a more inclusive, non-judgmental attitude uh, that's very visible. Uh, and so much so that in fact, I don't know whether you can see that, it might be a little bright, uh, but this is some photographic evidence. Here's a little, um, whatever, little souvenir and there's the gay rainbow colors with Francis in front. So, um, you know, there's this strong cultural perception uh, that Francis is gay friendly, and there's good reason for that perception. Uh, and then if you look at this in the context, again, of American society, I've talked to you earlier about the rise in the people, the numbers saying that they don't have religious affiliation. The other big, huge social trend, of course, has been the accelerating momentum and really quite rapid in favor of same-sex marriage, same-sex relationships, and then more recently same-sex marriage. And you see this is comparing white evangelicals who are the most conservative group in American society uh, with Catholics and with these rising numbers of the unaffiliated. And you see that Catholics are right up there. So two-thirds of Catholics today support same-sex marriage. Uh, so they're closer on these issues as on other issues uh, to the unaffiliated than they are, for example, to evangelicals. But this is the reality, and it's not just in American society, but in Europe and in, in many Latin American countries as well. Uh, and interesting enough here that when you look uh, at change, as I said, church teaching hasn't changed, but given the changes in secular culture and given the images of Francis Bean and some of the statements of his non-judgmental attitude, etc., one of the things that can be identified is that people are perceiving, these are American Catholics, are perceiving that church teaching has changed. So back in 2003, when uh, Pew and other pollsters would ask different people, including Catholics, uh, what their is same is the church's teaching on same-sex, or is same-sex marriage against your religion? In 2003, 65% of American Catholics said that it is against their religion. In December 2013, this would have been after who am I to judge those remarks, 53% of American Catholics said it was against their religion. And in August 2016, not long after Amoris Laetitia was issued where he talked about the stability of same-sex unions, 45% of American Catholics said the same-sex marriage is against their religion. So this is, we have a, a theorem in sociology about perception so that if you perceive a certain reality, then that's actually instrumental in making that reality come true so that people's perceptions are as important as the actual so-called objective reality. Uh, and certainly we see that uh, and it, it in turn then contributes to the momentum in favor of same-sex relationships because if more and more people think, those who are highly religious, if more and more of them think 
that same-sex marriage is not against the church's teaching, then they're more likely to act on those beliefs and in turn adds pressure to the teaching, etc. So that's just interesting how whether there's official change or not, the perception of change matters. Uh, but all of this has led, there's been a lot of controversy and it's ongoing. There's any of you who follow Twitter, and uh, in particular, it's just quite stunning, the, the viciousness of debate on both the right and on the left about these issues. Uh, but there's lots of questions whether Francis is, with some of these ideas, you know, about gays, even about climate change, is he, does he represent a rupture with existing Catholic teaching and with the tradition of earlier popes, such as here, Pope John Paul II, or is it continuity? Uh, so I just want to turn towards that question uh, now. And good for time, right? Um, and so the Synod on the Family was a very major event. Uh, it was really a two-year event called by Pope Francis to discuss really the issues facing the family today. And again, this is a global issue. It's not just American, but it's the global church. Uh, and it talked about a lot of issues, but it gave a lot of attention to these so-called irregular Catholics, uh, people who, and in particular, people who are divorced and remarried without an annulment. Uh, one of the tensions with this is that many of those who are divorced, which is a highly secular thing, and remarried without an annulment, fully want to participate in the life of the church, but church teaching doesn't allow them to receive communion. Officially, they're not excommunicated, but they're not allowed to receive communion because they're in a state of ongoing objective sin. That's the reasoning, because they're still in these uh, relationships un, uh, un, uh, rejected by the church, not blessed by the church. Uh, the Synod on the Family was a fascinating uh, two-year process. It was really a three-year process in a sense because before it actually happened, there was a lot of data gathering around the world. Dioceses across the world, including here in the U.S., were asked to gather lots of survey information asking about the state of Catholics and others in their dioceses, what they believed, what they didn't believe, what they thought about natural law, what kinds of family living arrangements they had, what their expectations were for their children and the kind of religious education they would get. So it was a very wide-ranging set of questions, unprecedented because uh, while sometimes the bishops do draw on sociological research, for the most part they tend to say, you know, opinion polls are not relevant to the articulation of church doctrine. Uh, nonetheless, when it came to the Synod on the Family, there was this big data gathering effort. Um, and so then there was two, two separate meetings of the Synod of Bishops where in October 2014, they spent three weeks discussing all of these issues, recognizing that gap that I showed you earlier between what church teaching says about several of these sexual moral, moral, sexual morality of these various issues, and how it is that people live their lives in relationships and in family life. Um, so there were some controversies which I'm happy to, to talk about, but ultimately the final report of the Synod emphasized that divorced and remarried Catholics, for example, should not feel excommunicated, and that was always, they weren't supposed to. And interestingly, they drew on John Paul's own language in a prior exhortation back in 1985, and John Paul is seen as very much articulating what might be seen as a conservative moral theology, right? Uh, and so this question about continuity or rupture, how could Francis's theology of the family or of gays or of anything be in continuity with John Paul's? But in fact, what the Synod did was to draw on John Paul's own language where he himself talked about pastoral discernment, where he noted that not all difficult situations are the same, that there's individual discernment necessary of ordinary Catholics working with their local pastor as a way of discerning true issues of blame and of moral culpability in their relationships. Uh, and so but this was a sort of a very, perhaps from one perspective, I want to say it was strategic theology that John Paul becomes invoked in the Synod on the Family to push change forward. At the same time, I would argue that's always, in a sense, sociologically, how church doctrine changes, because you're always building on the tradition that's already in place, and you're selectively looking within that tradition for bits and pieces of it that can give you permission to maintain the tradition, but to do so in a way that, at the same time, uh, takes account of the current realities and of the fact that not all marriages stay uh, as monogamous or stay stable for the rest of the people's lives. Uh, so this notion of pastoral discernment became a critical piece of the Synod on the Family. Uh, and subsequently then in this Amoris Laetitia that I've already referenced that Francis issued in response to the Synod, he again also said there, the second last quote, it can no longer simply be said that all those in any irregular 
situation are living in a state of mortal sin and are deprived of sanctifying grace, right? So this really is the most explicit statement really in the history of the church that those American Catholics that I was showing you in our survey data who make up their own mind about all of these issues may not necessarily be doing a terrible thing, that this is in fact to some extent part and parcel of what it means to be Catholic and that that is something that they have to deal with on an individual basis. Uh, and he also said uh, that individual cases can benefit from the help of the sacraments and this opened up the possibility that of, on a case-by-case -case admission that individual Catholics who are in these irregular situations can, in conversation with their local priest or with some other priest, uh, be admitted to the sacraments. So again, church teaching didn't change. The church's teaching on marriage is that it's between a man and a woman and that it's indissoluble, i.e. there's not supposed to be divorce, but marriages break up and that has to be dealt with. But so they didn't change their teaching, but at the same time it does change the teaching because you're saying we have to find ways to integrate all of these so-called irregular Catholics into the diverse community of Catholics and try to make them feel welcome within the church. Uh, so anyway, so despite some of these highly symbolic changes in terms of the mood, in terms of the tone, even as a lot of the official teaching has not been touched, uh, there are many challenges that still remain for these so-called irregular Catholics uh, because as John uh, or as Francis himself has said one can't flaunt objective sin and this has a long again uh, tradition in Catholicism where one has to avoid giving so-called giving scandal uh, and so that people who are living in these irregular situations whether as gays whether cohabiting with a heterosexual partner whether divorced and remarried without an annulment uh, they might have gotten full absolution from the local priest as a result of a long process of moral discernment, but at the same time, they're advised or really required not to be public about that identity. So there is this tension in sociology. We talk about the bifurcation of identity. Feminist sociologists talk about, you know, women have to go to work and then they have to do the double shift at home, and these are two bifurcated realities. Uh, but to some extent, that's also a tension within Catholicism where people individually can have a, a clear conscience, can have absolution from the church, can be free to, to go to communion, for example. Uh, and yet at the same time, if they do so in certain contexts, it looks as if they're flaunting their sin and giving others permission to disobey or to avoid the teaching of the church. Uh, so I would just... I can talk more about that if people are interested, but it's this issue of intersectionality, that it still is a complicated set of identities for people to, uh, to negotiate. Uh, and it becomes just more obvious when you look at gays or you look at divorced and remarried Catholics, but really every Catholic, I mean, as far as I know, almost every Catholic disagrees with some aspect of church teaching. Uh, obviously, the issue on contraception would be the most obvious point. So all of them, or many of them at least, are trying to grapple with this issue. How can they be good Catholics and at the same time embody and maintain the secular experiences that they are accustomed to using? Uh, and of course, these issues, just to close, I think these issues to some extent are not on the agenda of the millennial generation, many of the young students today, right, because you've grown up in a very different era, certainly in the case of gay rights, for example, a lot of gay, young Catholics that I talk to don't know what all the fuss is about gays and the church, for example. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, because you're supportive, many are, at least generationally wise, much more supportive of gay equality than older generations. So these are issues, expectations, that will come up in any conversation with young people, and certainly young people in the church. Uh, they're, the, they're also the least affiliated, I said. So these are going these tensions of how, do, how different Catholics or self-identified Catholics bring their secular expectations and experiences to their living out of a Catholic identity uh, are not easily dealt with, right? They're ongoing challenges. Um, and of course, here if you look, this is from a study a survey that I did with some co-authors earlier, or about a year ago, actually, April 2017, where we're looking at, uh, these are a series of questions that we've asked Catholics going back to the 1980s. You know, would you never leave the church? How important the church is in your life? It's very important, among the most important aspects of my life, and then weekly mass. And so these are by generation. So the millennial generation, they, they're sort of parents, the older post-Vatican II and then the pre-Vatican II, which are very dwindling numbers uh, these days. Uh, but you see, so the millennial generation, or the dark blue, or the navy here, 
so you see that their commitment to the church, if you measure it in terms of I would never leave, they're less likely to say that. Whereas your parents' generation and their grandparents' generation were very much tenacious about saying, yes, I disagree with some of these things, but I'm never going to leave. Or it's on a scale from one to 10, it's most likely that I won't leave, right? Uh, there, that has shifted over time too, a little bit, which I can talk about, but certainly the youngest generation are a little less likely, but still quite a lot of them, you know, almost, you know, well, you know, half of them are saying they'll never leave. So it depends on which way you look at these data. Uh, with the importance of the church, that the church is important in their lives, not as huge, the differences between the millennials and the, sort of the next two older generations, so to speak, are not so significant. Uh, the pre-Vatican II generation are the, high, the most highly committed. There will be people now in their 80s, um, so to speak. Uh, and then, of course, when you look at weekly mass, that's where you see, so this sort of objective behavior. Uh, weekly mass attendance has decreased for all age groups over the last 30 years. Uh, but looking here, you see very much that the older you get, the more likely you are to go to mass, right? What's surprising about that? Probably not too much surprising, because we know that older people tend to be a little more conservative, even if they started off being liberal. Uh, but we also know that if you don't participate in weekly mass, or even monthly mass, uh, that then you become more and more detached, sorry, more and more detached from the larger communal tradition of Catholicism and may be less likely to, if you do ever settle down and get married, to raise your children within that tradition. Uh, and therefore that becomes more acute, if you will, certainly from the church leader's point of view with the current generation, because even for self-identified Catholics, they're living with others of their own generation who are, for the most part, unaffiliated. So the cultural pressures against church, if you will, and against participation in the life of the church uh, sort of have a, have a further dampening effect, perhaps, on their ongoing commitment as they grow older to Catholicism. Uh, and so there's a final uh, slide that the, oh, I can't remember, you can see that it's a bit bright maybe, but this is a, a restaurant in Italy, I think it's in Milan, pizza restaurant, lots of tables are set, all very inviting. Sort of, to me, captures that Catholicism is a pluralistic tradition. There are many tables, there are many places at the table, uh, but people have to show up, right, uh, to avail and to continue to maintain commitment to that tradition and to contest these various issues which are highly contestable and contested in Catholicism. Uh, so thank you for your attention. I talk fast, but I'm happy to take uh, questions and uh, pushback and comments and whatever. Thank you very much. Yes. Well, I have to say that I think American Catholics are distinctive, uh, and this is sort of some of what I was saying earlier with the other data, uh, is that they really do combine this individualism plus commitment, and I don't see that in Europe. Now, Latin American Catholics are further different, but they seem to be more on the European pattern, where when they withdraw from the church because of various issues, uh, they, they just leave, right? They don't feel this attachment. American Catholics have a deep attachment. Uh, and so I think it's very hard to generalize and say, oh, all Catholics do this. And I, and, you know, so millennial Catholics, I would think that American millennials are also quite different because frankly, the first hand experience I have of young millennials in Ireland who were brought up, you know, these are my own, say, nieces and nephews who are now in their early 30s, who were certainly brought up in a very, uh, uh, by very religious, very Catholic parents with all good values and going to mass almost as rigid, or not rigid, as rich as it was for their, you know, my, grand, my own parents' generation. Basically, I would say they capture this whole generational loss where maybe three or four are not going to mass, right? That it's, three, it's not even the cultural connection is less. Uh, and these are people really steeped in the tradition. Um, of course, 
in the American context, again, it's different, but I do think it's changing with the rise of the unaffiliated. Now, that can, on the other hand, it can push people to more tenaciously hold on to their identity, say, oh, yes, I am Catholic or I am Methodist or whatever it is. But uh, just in terms of peer pressure and just how you're spending your weekend, uh, it's going forward, it's likely that few are actually going to be going to Mass. Uh, so that's so I'm just saying that I think it's very hard to say that I think American Catholics are very distinctive. And the funny thing is, so to speak, that a lot of people outside of America think that American Catholicism is just this most peculiar thing and that it's totally secularized. But in fact, it is, has more commitment than European Catholics, I would say. So these are big generalizations, but there's evidence. <laughs> Yes. Church's opportunity to build a more inclusive Yes. Um, can you speak to a little bit about some of the voices within the church in the U.S. currently, hierarchical church leader voices that I think are models and witnesses of an inclusive church that I think model and echo Francis's. Right. I think that Bishop McElroy in San Diego, um, Cardinal Supic in Chicago, yes. Cardinal Stove in Yes. Chicago, so yes. Know, yes. Coast to coast and everything in between. These comments about those Uh, uh, well, right, well, abs absolutely, because Catholicism is a universal tradition, but it's lived locally. Uh, and so, yes, a lot of people are very familiar or somewhat familiar with Francis and his travels and his statements, uh, but most people don't really read them. They can't get some of these sound bites, but they do know more about what their bishop says and their local priests. So, um, I mean, I think it is all the people you mentioned. I mean, these are the usual suspects, right? I mean, Bishop Kik but there were many before, I mean, of going back to the 1980s, which might be considered the high point of the Catholic bishops trying to build an inclusive society and inclusive church uh, with their statements, for example, on economic justice and some of their work with women that didn't end up, you know, there was listening sessions by Archbishop Weakland with women. It eventually, the, the bishops wanted to write an encyclical on women, but they eventually weren't able to write one, but at least they're making an effort uh, to be more inclusive, for example. So there's always been voices, but certainly I think most people would say that during John Paul's papacy, some of those voices certainly got silenced or pushed out a little bit. Uh, and so I think now we're seeing is a, a period of transition. Uh, but even someone like Cardinal Dolan, who I think what most people would see him as a conservative voice, he also has a certain tendencies sometimes towards inclusion. And I think we have to look for these little bits of evidence. You know, for example, he walks on the St. Patrick's Day LG, you know, parade, even though the, you know, there was some controversies for a few years about LGBT in that parade, but he, he walks in it. Uh, so I think it's those sorts of small, not small, I think significant gestures. Uh, but definitely right now, we can't pretend that there isn't polarization among the bishops. Uh, you know, Archbishop Chapu has been very vocal in pushing back against, as probably you know well, about Amoris Laetitia, really this emphasizing, you know, that the avoidance of sin, right, and scandal, and emphasizing that the church teaching has to be this way, and if you're gay or if you're divorced and remarried and working in a parish, you can't be doing parish ministry. Um, so there's lots of that. But yes, there are these other voices, but it's an ongoing, I don't agree with what Ross Duta, the commentator in the New York Times, was always full of doom and loom about schism in the Catholic Church. Despite the polarization, and as I say, it's certainly evident, I don't like Twitter myself, but sometimes when I look at it, it's just stunning, the viciousness of the rhetoric of these two sides of Catholicism. And these are high, well-known figures, but I don't think it's a, it's a schismatic situation. I think people have to mind Catholicism and mind the various aspects of its tradition uh, and not sort of get carried away with the extremes on either side. Um, but uh, did you want to, but the, the bishops getting, I mean, this Pope Francis has certainly appointed an awful lot of cardinals in his five years and presumably this cohort will be more inclusive of his and more attuned to his agenda. Um, you know, than if it was some other cardinal. So I think in that sense, even if, you know, his papacy doesn't last too long, he still has put in place these uh, people who presumably can carry it forward. And I think there's a lot of others that we don't hear about, but in their own local, we hear always about those, you know, who are controversial, who 
deny people access, and there's certainly a few of those, but I think even at the, on an everyday basis, there's probably many more who are doing the work with migrants, with, you know, now with DACA, for example, and immigrants and all of that. Yes. Well, I didn't put anything in about women because that would take a whole other uh, 20 minutes, or at least. Uh, you know, the funny thing is, in a sense, about women in the church, I'm talking about Pope Francis's communicative openness. And he is, I can give you lots of statements where he shows how open he is. And even just today or yesterday with his apology, realizing that he didn't uh, deal well with the Chilean sex abuse. He's out and he, he apologizes or whatever. Uh, he definitely has not changed anything on women's ordination uh, or on the status of women. So he has repeated verbatim things that, France, uh, that John Paul has said, including about women's special genius and we have to find a role for women in the church. Um, so he may have appointed more women. There are, I think, more women in the top departments you know, in the Curia. And there's certainly a lot of women, obviously, running colleges and canon lawyers and all of that. They've always been doing that. Uh, but in terms of the culture, even though he's very critical of the clerical culture, with all due respect, uh, all our opinion polls data shows that a lot of women and men who favor women's, a majority in America favor women's ordination. But when you go beyond those basic questions, it also comes apparent that many of them feel that the clericalism won't change until women become priests. Right? And so it really becomes that it's not about just putting women in, as, not just, but having them as lawyers or top uh, decision makers in the curia, that the real power still is with the collar. And if you don't have the collar, then talking about women in the church isn't going to progress too far. Yes. Yes. Yes, and that, so that's... Sort of like the way that it happened. Yes, but one could also... Yes, and that's when we wait the results of that commission, but it's still interesting that with all the talk about this feminine genius that, you know, what are we going to do about it uh, if they are denied ordination? And then given just even at a practical level the shortage of priests, which to some extent is, you know, it's, it's more compelling a problem in some dioceses than others, but the discussion of women's ordination could be part of a much larger discussion of what kinds of priests do we need today and how should, you know what I mean? So it could move it away from being this, if you like, political question about women's equality and ordination and really turn it into a Catholic question. What kind of priesthood in the wake of the sex abuse crisis as well? Like what kinds of priesthood or what kind of priesthood do we need and who can serve those roles? So, uh, yeah, so it'll be interesting to see what happens with the deacons, yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Because there have been no changes indicated in the official teaching of the mm -hmm. church. And there really doesn't seem, doesn't seem likely there will be soon. So if, you know, Francis, of course, is very pastoral and very open, and, but he could well be uh, followed by a hard line liner who could really undo, you know, everything that Pope Francis has, has accomplished. I mean, see that as a, you did talk about the growing number of people that he has actually appointed as cardinals, right. but do you see that as a, you know, well, possibility? Yeah, well, I would be more optimistic, I suppose, in the sense that I would say that all of these, like the Synod on the Family, that's all now part of official church teaching, right? All the documents, all the reports, including the controversy. So the first Synod in, in October in, in in October 2014, there was a lot of discussion, very positive, affirming language, for example, of gays and about the gifts that they bring to the church and all kinds of very nice, affirming statements. They were ultimately deleted because it did cause controversy. Some of the other bishops said that, oh, there's not enough about the theology of sin of John Paul and all of that. Uh, 
But still it's on the record that imagine this synod of bishops in October 2014 said these positive things, even then if it doesn't translate into, oh, now let's withdraw some of the statements from 1986 or whatever and issue a new statement. Uh, and the same then with divorce and remarriage. I mean, I think some of the language of the synod of the family as well and as uh, Francis himself, it's really very evocative. And it's very, I think for people who are in these so-called irregular situations, I think you can't deny that these words have not been said by top officials of the church, even if the next pope is someone who tries to roll back some of these on the ground changes. So that's how I would see it, that once you put it out there, once it's, now of course not everyone follows the teachings as closely as I do as, a, as a studying them or many of you, um, most Catholics don't know what the church is talking about on most issues, but still these things, like who am I to judge, these things permeate into the everyday discourse in a way that conveys change. And I think then people make it happen. Uh, but it's, it's an open question for sure. But it does raise this other, I mean, the core question, how can the church maintain tr its tradition, including its institutional tradition and the communal tradition of the mass, if it's going to disallow from the sacraments all these different kinds of people who are living in these so-called irregular situations. Um, you know, but that's, I mean, that's, some people would say we need a smaller church. I mean, Benedict famously said that, Archbishop Chapu seems to endorse that view, Archbishop Sample in Portland, but ultimately that would seem, in my opinion, to be anti-Catholic in a sense, if we're supposed to be Catholic with a small C and pluralistic, and there's lots, I mean, as I say, when you read the Synod, uh, final report and to see how they quote, you know, John Paul and what John Paul himself said about not all difficult, you know, not all situations are the same. Um, so I think that's all, this is all the resources of, these are all the resources of Catholicism, the doctrinal resources that can be drawn on to embrace change even as you're maintaining continuity with the larger tradition. Yes, please. That's a very good question. Um, uh, you know, so by, by, by coming out and clarifying and saying, well, in fact, Archbishop Chapu did himself, this is the Archbishop of Philadelphia, he issued a couple of statements, uh, I guess about two years ago, when Joe Biden, who was then still the vice president, and he officiated at a same-sex wedding. And Archbishop Chapu issued a state, very critical statement saying that this was obviously totally contrary to Catholic teaching and that it gives the faithful the sense that in fact the church approves of that. But I would argue, yes, so you could, I agree with what you're saying, why not? If it's not contradicted, why not, you know? But I think what it does, it has the opposite effect. The more you try to contradict and say this is wrong, the more people who are half listening think, oh yes, the church has changed its teaching. So it's very hard on perceptions of anything. You know that yourselves as college students. If there's a rumor about something going to happen, a change and whatever, and it's a rumor, it gets on a life of its own and sometimes becomes sort of self-fulfilling. Um, and of course, if the church, whoever the church would be, if some official statement had to come out contradicting every misperception or wrong assumption, to, that would be a lot to do. But, but it, it raises this very interesting question, though. What should the, how should church officials respond to some of these things? Uh, and they do respond when they're high-profile Catholics, for example, involved. And on that issue, for example, of women's ordination, Mary McAleese, who you know, was, was the president of Ireland and for many years actually was a very uh, close advisor to the Irish Catholic bishops, certainly on the Northern Ireland issue, she now is quite a strong advocate of equality, LGBT equality, women's equality, uh, and they disinvited her from a conference that was being held in the Vatican grounds. It wasn't sponsored by the Vatican. This was just a month ago. Uh, it just seemed to me such a, and partly why they disinvited her was because they see her as such a high profile person. If I was saying that, nobody cares. But if this high profile person is saying, that's what makes other, you know, church officials nervous. But by disallowing her, they only got much more, got global news coverage. And then of course she ended up giving a blistering speech talking about the misogyny, the empire of misogyny that the Catholic church is. So, you know, when they do engage publicly on these issues, uh, they often do themselves in a sense, not necessarily a disservice, but adds to the controversy in a way that doesn't help the credibility of church leaders. Mm -hmm. 
but you know, this going back to the question on youth. I mean, the next synod, as many of you know, is on it's on, on youth, and so there was just a, this past month a meeting of a lot of the young delegates who would be going to that from America and elsewhere in Rome, uh, and so that will be an interesting, uh, you know, again, event to see you know what actually happens. And John, uh, Pope Francis is always insisting that he wants to hear from people themselves. And he doesn't want the church to be talking about youth or to youth, but he wants them to listen to youth. And he wants youth, young people, you know, to be contributing and moving forward. But what that will look like, because the initial reports were that they want, not necessarily they want change, but they want the church to respond to issues of equality in the church. Uh, so that's going to be later this year, October 2018, right? So it's already April. Uh, so that'll be interesting just to see what that might do for millennial issues here in America, but also other places. Any more questions? All right, thank you so much. Well, thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you.